Amen. Thank you so much for that song. We appreciate it. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible now and turn with me to the book of Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The third book of the Bible. For those of you who like to be ahead, we're going to be in Leviticus for a little bit. Then we're going to the Gospel of John, then 1 Corinthians, and then finish up back in the beginning of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Um, Say, so we got time for all that? We're going to hurry. We're going to hurry, I promise you. Before we read, I, I want to say this. More and more, I've, I've been studying the Bible for over half a century now, still learning things, and you could say, well, you must be a slow learner, and you'd be right. But um, I'm still learning things, and I'm more and more impressed with how the Bible, just all of it, fits together. There are so many things, and I'm going to try to show you just some of this today. can't show you all of it. I'm going to show you some of it that shows the unity of the Bible and how this cannot be coincidence. It, it, the odds of what we're going to see today being coincidence are just astronomical. And uh, speaking of astronomical, there was the first uh, manned space flight launched from the United States yesterday, the first one since 2011. Uh, just say, what's that have to do with the message? Not much, but it is astronomical. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to share that with you. I, I, I get excited about that kind of thing. I always have. Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus chapter 23. Eventually, we're going to be reading and looking at verses 4 to 22. But to begin with, I want you to look at verses 19 and 20 with me Leviticus 23 verses 19 and 20 it says then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings and the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest we're going to talk to you today about four of the seven feasts of Israel, but we're going to focus on one, and that is the Feast of Shavuot, and in English, the Feast of Pentecost. We'll say more about that, but first let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we can begin to gather together again. And Lord, as we come to this important time in scripture, this important time in history, this important time in prophecy, this important time in our own lives, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, give us guidance by your own Holy Spirit into all truth, and help us, Lord, to receive exactly what the Spirit would say to the church in this hour. Lord, for those who may not know you, may not have the Holy Spirit in their lives, may not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, we pray for their soul salvation. We pray that they would open their heart and trust you and receive you. For those of us who do know you, give us the wisdom we need, give us the guidance we need, and help us, Lord, to see not only history and prophecy, but application in our own lives. Now, Lord, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning again about the different uh, Feast of Israel. There are seven of them. Passover, unleavened bread, uh, first fruits, um, and then Pentecost. And then there's the Feast of Tabernacles, Atonement, and Trumpets. Uh, seven all together. And I want to focus on the first four and then really on the fourth one. Now, why are we doing this? Because today is the day of Pentecost. Well, how is that? Well, we're going to tell you about it as we go along. But that's what I want to talk to you about, the day of Pentecost. And that's today. That is today. Today is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost, and we'll see more of this in a moment, is 50 days after the Feast of first fruits. So the, the first feast is Passover. And then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. comes right behind it. We're going to see all this in the Scripture in a moment. And then you have the Feast of uh, first, uh, sorry, Pentecost, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits. And then 
50 days after the Feast of First Fruits is the Feast of Pentecost. And that's where we are today. Now, yesterday, uh, the Hebrew name for that is Shavuot. And yesterday in synagogues, not only all over this country, but all over the world, that feast was celebrated. And the rabbis, most of them, I'm sure did this, uh, maybe all of them did, they would stand and read the Ten Commandments. And they would teach the people in the synagogues that there was a special blessing for anyone who was there and would hear the priest, or I'm sorry, not the priest, the rabbi, uh, reading the Ten Commandments on the Feast of Shavuot. Now, why do they think that's a special blessing for that? Because according to tradition, now that's an important phrase, according to tradition, the Feast of Shavuot is, celebrates the time when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. Now, I'm about to say something here. I don't want you to think I'm saying anything to diminish or, or deride anyone. That is not the intent at all. But I'm going to tell you this. You won't find that in the Bible. Oh, you'll find that Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. But you will not find that it was on that day and time. So why do they celebrate that day and time? It's purely tradition to celebrate it then. Oh, so they're wrong to do that. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Why not? Is it wrong to celebrate the giving of the law? I don't think so. What would be wrong in that? Is it wrong to have a day set aside to celebrate the giving of the law? I don't think so. The Bible does not prescribe that that's what this feast is about. And we're going to show you what the Bible says it's about. But if you want to celebrate the giving of the law on the Feast of Pentecost, that, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I was telling some of the camp staff yesterday, we do the same thing in, in Christian tradition. We celebrate December 25th, the, the birth of the Savior. And the truth of the matter is, most likely Jesus was not born on December the 25th. Okay? Uh, I've studied and researched that, studied it out, and, and I cannot find that he was born on December the 25th. Now, there's some people maintain that he was, and they say they can prove it, but I'm telling you, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying that. I cannot find proof that he was born on December 25th. But was Jesus born? Yes. Is it wrong to celebrate? Well, I've heard people say, no, you shouldn't celebrate that at all. As a matter of fact, in the colonial days, there were colonies that outlawed the, the celebration of Christmas. They said, that's wrong. It's, it's pagan. It's not right. You should not celebrate Christmas and you got in trouble if you did. Really? Yeah, you got to know your history, folks. You really do. Um, so is there any biblical basis for celebrating the birth of Jesus? Well, let me ask you something. In the Gospel of Luke, when the angels appeared to the shepherds and announced the uh, birth of the Lord, and they sang glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Was that a celebration? Was that a celebration of the Lord's birth? It was, wasn't it? And then later, when these wise men come in the Gospel of Matthew and they give, was that a celebration of the birth of the Lord? Apparently it was. So evidently there is biblical basis for celebrating the birth of the Lord. But the Bible does not say you will celebrate the Lord's birth on December 25th. It doesn't say that. So that part is tradition. Am I making sense to you? I hope so. So again, I'm not criticizing uh, rabbis and synagogues for celebrating the giving of the law and the Feast of Shavuot. Feast of Shavuot. Well, what I'm telling you is so much easier to just say Pentecost, so we're going to do that, all right? <laughs> um, the, the thing is, that's not what that feast is really about. Not wrong to do it. I actually think it's a good thing that they take time out and read the Ten Commandments. I wish more people would do that. And pay attention, not just read it, pay attention to what it says. But let's see what the Feast of Pentecost is really about according to the Bible. There are certain events that mark history in our memories. Yesterday I mentioned the first U.S. launched manned space flight since 2011. You mean no Americans have gone in space since 2000? Oh, they have. Well, you said this the first one. Right. Because our folks who have needed to go to the space station since 2011 go over to Russia and they go up with the Russians and come back with the Russians. That's what's been going on. Okay? 
Yesterday marked the first time since 2011 a U.S. launched manned space flight occurred, and they're planning to go to the space station. That was largely because of the private corporation uh, SpaceX, uh, their engineering and their spacecraft and so forth, which is owned by Elon Musk, who does Tesla and a lot of other things. Now, that's all been in the news, but maybe you missed it because there's a lot of other things that are going on in the news, but <laughs> it's all been there. So maybe that's a date to remember. You can probably remember, uh, as most of us can, that date in 1969 when man first walked on the moon. There are also some other dates where some of you weren't alive when these things happened, but those of you who were, I'm pretty sure you could tell us, stand up right now and tell us where you were and what you were doing when these things occurred. November 22nd, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated. I know exactly where I was and what I was doing when I heard that news. And if you were alive then, you probably can do the same thing. January 28, 1986, it's talking about space flight, the space shuttle Challenger carrying the first teacher to go into space exploded just seconds after takeoff. I know exactly where I was, what I was doing when I got that news. I heard that news over WRMB radio. September 11th, 2001. The attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the failed attack that crashed into the Pennsylvania field. You know <clears throat> where you were and what you were doing when that happened. When you got that news, or when you saw that footage. Or maybe you were there and saw it in person. Now, I, I was not there and saw it in person. I was here when it happened, got the news right here. But I've been to all three of those sites. And, uh, you know, I've had people tell me people I know say the whole thing's a hoax never happened and I have a one word answer to that nonsense nonsense I've been to those three sites it happened don't let anybody tell you otherwise this same thing goes with the landing on the moon in 69 people say that never happened that was all done filmed in a movie studio same answer it goes to that nonsense Okay. Well, how do you know? Well, it wasn't, I'm going to be very clear about this, it was not Neil Armstrong, it was not from the Apollo 11 mission, but you see that hand right there? That hand shook hands with an astronaut who walked on the moon. Anybody else got a hand that did that? Okay, not here, but a lot of, lots of other people do, I'm sure, but maybe just not here this morning. And no, I was not on the moon when we shook hands, just, just so you know. We were in a movie studio. No, we weren't. I'm just kidding. That's not true either. But there are happy times when you can remember where you were and what you were doing. Some happy times for me. January 15th, uh, 1983, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was at Winston Drive Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. What were you doing? I was getting married. I remember that real well. I can tell you exactly where I was, what I was doing. Okay. Um, April 30th, 1985, our first daughter was born. Our other children were born in June of 86, May of 88, June of 93, February of 97, and November of 98. I remember where I was for all of those. Why? I was right there where, the, where they were born. Matter of fact, uh, I don't know if I've shared this recently. I know we've talked about it before. Uh, our first daughter, Amanda, was born at Bethesda Hospital and one day prior to that, I think, uh, Johnson Glaude was born at Bethesda Hospital, and they were both in the nursery there at the same time. And here's the thing, our families didn't even know each other then. Okay, <laughs> didn't even know it, but they were both in the nursery there at the same hospital, same time. Now, the Hebrew calendar is different than the calendar that we use. We, the calendar we use is, is basically a Roman calendar. Uh, and the Hebrew calendar is different. For example, we mark the beginning of the year in what month? January. The Hebrew calendar marks the beginning of the year in the month of Nisan. Almost like Nisan, like the car, but with one less S. Uh, the Nisan, month of Nisan, is the beginning of the Hebrew calendar. And that corresponds to March or April, depending on the year. 
Okay, it, it'll vary a little bit because again, it's a lunar calendar, whereas we're using a solar calendar and there are other differences. God prescribed that as the beginning of the year. Why? That is the beginning of the agricultural year. And God told the people of Israel that would be the beginning of the year for them. So I want you to look with me now at the scripture. We've done a lot of talking. I want us to look at the scripture and go to verse 4, Leviticus 23 and verse 4. And I want you to see God's ordinances of the feast days. This is very important to understand. Stay with me. It's not only important from a historical standpoint, it's important from a prophetic standpoint, and it's important for us to understand our Bible, and it's important for us to know what God is doing today and what he wants to do in our lives. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 4. God says this, These are the feasts of the Lord even holy convocations which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. The, in the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Very important to understand. Passover occurs on the fourteenth day of the month of Nisan. Why? Because that's when the first Passover occurred. And God is saying every year on the fourteenth day, don't miss that fourteenth day, that's important, of the month of Nisan, the first month, at even, you celebrate Passover. Okay, Passover is when the uh, angel of death, when death passed over Egypt, the firstborn son of every house died. But all those who had the blood of the lamb in the sign of the cross on the door were saved. And whoa, 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 where does it say in the sign of the cross? It says that in the Bible. Really, I don't remember reading where it says the sign of the cross. All right, let me show you. Here's the door here, and I didn't even realize there was a cross there. Well, that's convenient. All right, so we are here, and this is the door to your house. And the father of the house is to take the blood of the lamb, and he's supposed to put the blood on here, and here, and here. What does that make? It's the sign of the cross. So every house had the sign of the cross in, in, don't miss this, in the blood of the lamb on their door at Passover. And everybody who was under the sign of the cross in the blood of the lamb was saved. Do you not see a prophetic inference in that? I don't know how you could miss it. Now, let, let's be fair about this. Did the people of Israel, that first Passover in Egypt, did they know that the Savior coming would be named Jesus? No. Did they know he'd be born in Bethlehem? No. Did they know that he was going to die on a cross? No. Did they know that he would be called the Lamb of God? No. All that would be revealed later. But there's somebody who did know all that, and that's God. And God was showing them all through the Old Testament things to come. So that's Passover. Now, <clears throat> come to verse 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 6. On the 15th day, so the next day, Next day after Passover, on the 15th day of the same month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat the unleavened bread. So, unleavened bread lasts for seven days. And for seven days they're to eat unleavened bread. Leaven is like yeast that's added to the bread and makes the bread rise. So basically what you have is flat bread. And why were you to not eat leaven in your bread? Because leaven is a type of sin... And it pictures sin, not, not saying it's sinful to eat leaven, but during this time, God's teaching something, and it's a type of sin, and you eat the bread without the leaven, it's more pure. So it has to do with purity and holiness. So they were to do that, and God goes on, verse 7 says, In the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread lasts seven days, but it begins when? On the 15th. After Passover's on the 14th of Nisan, Feast of Unleavened Bread's on the 15th, next day. Follow carefully, because this is all going to come together and be very, very important. Takes us to verse 9. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I have given you, ye shall reap the harvest thereof. Then ye shall bring a sheaf, one sheaf, of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Now here's what this is. A sheaf, one. You hope when you plant a crop, you get more than one sheep. <laughs> you want lots of sheaves, okay? You know, that hymn we sing sometimes, bringing in the sheaves. All right, so the, that's what you want. You want to bring in the sheaves, but this is one sheaf. And which one? It's the first one that springs up of the harvest. And you bring that first one to the priest. And what's he going to do with it? Verse 11, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. That sheaf is symbolically accepted for you. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer, and, and, and don't miss that, on the morrow, in the morning, after the Sabbath, the priest is going to do that. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf, and he lamb, without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two-tenth deals of flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine the fourth part of an hen. And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought in offering unto your God, it shall be a statute forever, throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So that's the first fruits. The first fruit is one sheaf. It's the very first one you get and you bring it to the priest and he offers it to the Lord for you, for you on your behalf. So follow, you got Passover. Passover, the blood of the lamb protects you from death. You're under the sign of the cross. You have unleavened bread. It's a quieter feast. But it is a feast, and it's purity, a time of purity. And then you're going to have first fruits. And first fruits comes right after that, is the third feast, third feast on the third day, Passover. There's the 14th, unleavened bread begins on the 15th, first fruits on the 16th of Nisan. Okay, and, and this may get confusing, but stay with me because it's so important. So the Feast of First Fruits on the 16th day of Nisan or the third day after Passover. Look again at verse 11. <clears throat> and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. So the First Fruits offering was the very beginning of the spring harvest which marks the beginning of the year for the people of Israel. Again, on the Hebrew calendar, it marks, listen, the beginning of new life. Winter is over. The springtime is here. A new year is beginning, and it's a time of new life. Let's get to that fourth feast. Verse 15. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf, one, of wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Seven Sabbaths means seven weeks. This feast is also called the Feast of Weeks. So seven Sabbaths. Now seven weeks made up of seven days. How many days is that? 49. 49 days, right? Okay, stay with me. Then on, in verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. So one day seven weeks seven sabbaths plus one day 50 days ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the lord 50 days of what 50 days from the feast of first fruits unto the feast of pentecost you with me okay verse 17 and you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves now you're not just bringing a sheep you've already milled this grain and you've made bread out of it two wave loaves of two tenth deals and they shall be of fine flour, they shall be bacon with leaven, they are the first fruits unto the Lord, and you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish, seven the number of completion in the Bible, of the first year, and one young bullock and two rams, they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord, 
with their meat offering and their drink offering, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Do you know in, in our Wednesday night studies of the book of Revelation, you know what we found is a sweet savor unto the Lord? Your prayers. Your prayers. Same concept. Verse 19. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. So that feast of first fruits was made for you, but this offering is made for the priest. Okay. 21. And you shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you that ye do no, no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger, I am the Lord your God. So when they, they're bringing in the harvest now, first fruits, the very first sheaf of harvest brought for an offering of the Lord. Now you've had seven weeks to bring in the rest of your harvest. And now you're celebrating the ingathering of the harvest. This is, again, very important. What is the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot about? It's about celebrating the ingathering of the harvest and then bringing an offering of that to the Lord. But you're not to take it all. The people of Israel were to leave a little bit of gleaning on the side for the poor, for the person who didn't have any crops. They didn't have anything. They can come along after you've reaped your harvest, whatever you missed. And, and if I'm no farmer, but I know anytime you glean a field, you, you leave a little bit behind. You miss some of it. Uh, whatever you miss, that's for the poor to come along and, they, and, and so that they're taken care of. They have something to eat. Okay, that is what the Feast of pa uh, Pentecost is all about. Okay, Passover on the 14th, unleavened bread on the 15th, first fruits on the 16th, and then 50 days later, Pentecost. All right, leave the Old Testament if you will. Turn with me over to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. But keep in mind everything we've just seen in the law of the Lord. John chapter 14 and just two verses we're going to look at here. Verses 16 and 17. John chapter 15. I'm sorry, 14 verses 16 and 17. John 14. The Lord Jesus is aware that his time on earth is drawing very short. He's teaching his disciples and he's preparing them for that which must shortly come to pass. He knows that in just hours he's going to the cross. He knows he'll be before that arrested in the garden and beaten and then go to the cross and there he will sacrifice himself for our sins. He will become the Lamb of God. The disciples don't know this. They have no idea that's going to happen. He's told them before, but they do not realize, they do not understand it's actually going to happen. They certainly don't know what's about to happen. But he's preparing them. And he's also telling them about what it's going to be like after that. Because after the crucifixion, obviously everything's going to change. So he's getting them ready for that. And in verses 16 and 17... The Lord makes a promise. But now here's something else very important to understand. All this takes place at Passover. Don't miss that connection. All this takes place at Passover. John 14, verse 16. The Lord says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now that word another is very significant because... There were two Greek words primarily that are used in the New Testament, translated another in English. And they both mean another. They mean not this one, but another one. But the big significant difference is this. One means another of a different kind. Uh, 
I'm driving a Chevrolet and I'm going to get another car and it's going to be a Ford. Another of a different kind. Okay? But the word used here means another of the same kind. Jesus is saying there's another comforter coming who's going to be just like me. That's what he's saying. Very important to get that. He says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he, the comforter, may abide with you forever. So when the comforter is given, how long is he going to stay with Jesus' disciples? Forever. Forever. Verse 17. Who is this comforter? He tells us. Even the Spirit, notice capitalized Spirit, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The unbelieving world does not receive the comforter. The unbelieving world does not receive the spirit of truth. Why? Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. They do not see the spirit of truth. They do not receive the spirit of truth. They do not know the spirit of truth. But ye know him. Ye, who? The believers, the disciples of Jesus, they know the spirit of truth. And why do they know him? For he dwelleth with you. He lives with you and shall be in you. He's not only going to be with you by your side, he's going to be in you. This, again, is a very, very important promise. By the way, I talked about this comforter being another of the same kind. Now here he's called the spirit of truth. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Paul uses the name, the Spirit of Christ. That's pretty clear, isn't it? That's what he means when he says it's another of the same kind. He's going to be just like me. This is the Spirit of Christ who will come. They are one and the same. Jesus promised the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth would come. He would live with the disciples forever. Uh, the world cannot receive him, neither know him. And yet, he's going to be there and be with us the believers. Now, leave John. Go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then we're going to go back and finish in Acts uh, and finish up fairly quickly here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One of my all-time, if not my all-time favorite chapter of the Bible. Love all the Bible. Love studying. My favorite book is John, but 1 Corinthians 15 is such a favorite chapter because it's all about resurrection. Whole chapter. All about resurrection. And it's beautiful. Now watch this. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. Paul says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the, can you say that next word with me? First fruits. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Slept. Paul's euphemism for those who have died. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. Let's go on. Verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The natural man is called in Adam. The unsaved man is in Adam. We are all descendants of Adam. But once you are in Christ, all who are in Christ are made alive. When does that happen? When you trust him as Savior, when you are born again, you are in Christ. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ, places you into so as to become part of the Lord. Verse 23. But every man in his own order. Watch it. Christ the, what's the word again? First fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Remember what happened in the old feast? The Passover happened, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the Feast of First Fruits, in which one chief was brought to the tabernacle and later the temple for the priest to offer to the Lord for the people who brought it. But then, 50 days later, the ingathering the harvest comes. And that's big. That's not one. There's lots coming in then. Many sheaves. Say, so where are you going with this? This is very simple. Just stay with me. Okay? 
Jesus was crucified on the feast of Passover, the 15th of Nisan. He was buried and lay in the tomb on the feast of unleavened bread, the 16th of Nisan. Then on the third day, the 17th of Nisan, he rose from the grave on the feast of first fruits and became the first fruits of the resurrection of those who are saved. What's coming next? The end gathering of the harvest. Does that make sense to you? Do you not understand that God told the people of Israel all this thousands of years ahead of time? And then they repeated it year after year after year after year so that they wouldn't forget? That's what Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot, is about. Not about the giving of the law. Nothing wrong with celebrating the giving of the law. Let me repeat that. Not criticizing that. That's fine. But you want to know what's really about? This is it. This is it. Now, we're going to finish up. Let's go to, um, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts, chapter 1. And there we'll finish up. We're going to finish up in Acts 1 and 2. Acts, chapter 1, and verse 1. We were in this passage not too long ago, Easter, I, I, it was which was 50 days ago. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Luke is saying, he's referring to the gospel that he wrote. He said, I wrote this before and told you about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after his death, he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. That's an important phrase. Many proofs, and those proofs were infallible. They are hard facts. Again, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen to them 40 days. Not just a few days, not just a week, but 40 days Jesus appeared to people after the resurrection, showed himself alive in positive passions so it could not be denied. 40 days, keep that in mind, that's very important. Jesus is crucified on Passover in the tomb on unleavened bread resurrected on first fruits and then for 40 days after that he shows himself alive and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of god verse 4 and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he you have heard of me what is that promise? Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. I mentioned this just a second ago. Let me run it by you again. The word baptize. The word baptize comes into English. It is a word that did not exist in the English language until the Bible was translated into English. It is not a translated word. For example, to translate a word. If I say yes and I want to say it in Spanish, I will say si. If I want to say it in French, I'll say we. Oui. If I want to say it in Mandarin, I'll say due. But it's it's a different word. You, you with me? Means the same thing. Means yes. If I want to say it in American Sign Language, I'll say this. You know? It's just, it, it's, all, but it's all different words. Means the same thing, but different words. In the Greek language, the word is baptizo. And it only came in the English language when the Bible was translated into English and they took that word baptizo and didn't translate it into an English word. They transliterated it. They brought the Greek word into English and that's where we get the word baptize. So what's the big deal about that? Here's the big deal. The word baptize means this. It means to place into so as to become part of. In the New Testament time, <clears throat> excuse me, New Testament times, they would build a building and they would have a cornerstone that the building was uh, 
lined up off of so important for the building it keeps everything square and, and plumb and like it ought to be and then when the building is finished they took a stone and placed it into the wall they didn't attach it to the wall they placed it into the wall so it became part of the wall commemorating when this building was built and who built it we have a similar plaque uh, back there saying when we dedicated this building and so forth but ours isn't baptized into the wall ours is attached to the wall okay they didn't do it that way they placed that stone into the wall so it became part of the wall and that's what the word baptize means so when you baptize when you baptize somebody in water what do you do you place them into the water well I the church I came from they poured a little water on you well that's their tradition we talked about tradition earlier that's not what the word means the word means to place into so it's become part of part of the water no it's symbolic you're not becoming part of the water you're being placed in the water but you're being placed into the body of Christ so Jesus says here look at verse 5 again John truly baptized with water and that was symbolic but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Remember Jesus said when the spirit of truth would come, he would be dwell with you and be in you. So what's the Holy Ghost? What's the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Well, that's when we shout! Well, it's a lot of people believe that, but that's really not what it is. Now, if you want to shout, shout. I'm not, I'm not getting off on that. But the point I'm trying to get you to see is that's not what the word means. What the word means is that the Holy Spirit takes the believer and places them into Christ so you become part of Christ, and that's what it means to be in Christ. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Let's keep going. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? They knew that he was the Messiah of Israel, and the Messiah was to restore the kingdom. So, Lord, you've been crucified, you've been buried, you've risen again, you've been around here for 40 days. Is now, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Understandable, they would ask that question. Watch Jesus answer. Verse 7, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father put his own power, but ye shall receive power. You're going to receive power. It's not in your power to know when these things are going to happen, but you're going to have power. Here's your power. You will receive power when? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's when you receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and what are you going to do with this power? You shall be witnesses unto me. A witness is somebody who tells what they've seen and what they know to be true. You're going to be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's their power, to be witnesses. They're empowered by the Holy Ghost to be witnesses to the whole world. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. A cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, not another, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. What are these two men in white apparel saying? You just saw him go, he's coming again. That's what they said. And it won't be another like him. It'll be him. Now watch this. All this happened when? 40 days after the resurrection. Are you with me? Watch. Verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Now, they're all in the upper room praying together. And in verse 15 it says, In those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, un, 
and said the number of names together were about 120. So how many of them were there? 120. That's not coincidental either. Three is the number of the Trinity. Four times three is 12. Am I right about that? Math's not my subject. Am I right? Okay. Four times three is 12. 10 times 12 is what? 120. Don't miss that. It's, it's, it's not an accident. It's not a coincidence that there were 120 of them. There they are. 40 days after the resurrection, they begin to pray. How long does this prayer meeting last? It lasts for 10 days. 10 days they prayed. During that time, we're not going to read the rest of it for time's sake, but during that time, they choose Matthias to replace Judas as the apostle. And some people say they made a mistake doing that. How is it that they're in the middle of 10 days of prayer and they, the events happen in chapter 2 that we're about to see and you're going to say they, they weren't following the Lord and choosing Matthias? I, I can't buy that. I'm sorry. It, obviously, they were very close to the Lord at this time. That takes us to chapter 2. Not that the rest of chapter 1 isn't important, but for time's sake, we need to move on. Chapter 2 and verse 9. The first phrase of chapter 2 in the first verse is so significant. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Jesus crucified at Passover in the tomb on unleavened bread resurrected at first fruits, shows himself alive for 40 days, ascends to heaven. The apostles pray for 10 days, and then the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, has fully come. Just like God prescribed in the law of Moses thousands of years before. Just like the people of Israel practiced year after year, century after century, for millennia before this. So what happened when the day of Pentecost was fully come? Watch it carefully. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Those 120 disciples are all still together in the same place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. How many of those 120 were filled? All. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what did that do? And began to speak with other tongues. The word tongues there, glossalia, literally means languages. They didn't get new physical organs in their mouth. They got new languages. Well, how do you know that? I kept reading all right. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is a special gift of God that they were able to speak with other languages. Listen to this. We don't have time to go back and look at it. Genesis chapter 11, you're going to have to read it for yourself. All the world speaks one language. All the world is building their own religion that excludes God. They're making man the focal point of worship man appears to be technologically advanced at that time and man's going to worship man and god comes down and does what divides their languages so that they can't understand each other so that while they're building this tower uh one of them guys up there working he turns to his friend a little bit down there and says hey hand me a hammer will you and the guy says what are you talking about you know, they, 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 don't, they can't understand each other anymore. And God divided them. What happened here is God temporarily reversed that so that everybody understood each other again for a very short time, but for a very specific purpose. It wasn't just a, a you know what, I haven't done a big miracle in a while. I, let me just pull one off here. Wasn't that wasn't it at all. A very specific purpose. Look again, verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Verse 5. And they were dwelling... They, 
I'm sorry, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, Jewish men, devout men, watch it, out of every nation under heaven. From all over the world, Jewish men were there. Why were they there? It was the feast days. It's Pentecost. That's why they were there. Verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Why? Because that, don't miss this, every man heard them speak in his own language. This was not a, a prayer language as some people say. This was not a language that the devil can't understand. I, I don't even want to go there. This was a miracle where every one of these Jewish men from all over the world heard them speak in the language of where he was from. How do you know that? Well, I know it, first of all, because it says so here. Every man heard them speak in his own language, but it gets better because it even names the languages for us. We know which ones. Verse 7, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one at another, Are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, our own language, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya and about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues, in our languages, the wonderful works of God. You know what God did? God enabled the apostles of that day to preach and everybody to understand in their own language what they were saying. That's what happened. Why did God do that? So that the whole world could begin to hear about Jesus. So verse 12, they were all amazed and were in doubt. They didn't understand why this was happening. They'd never seen anything like it. And the reason they'd never seen anything like it is nothing like it had ever happened before. And they were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? What, we, we don't know. What is this about? This is, this, is, this is something brand new. Others mocking. Some of these people believe. We'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Others mocking said, These men are full of new. These guys are drunk. How does that possibly explain everybody hearing it in their own language? It doesn't. 14, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. And Peter stands up and he begins to preach. When does he preach? When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now we're going to, again, for the sake of time, we're going to skip most of Peter's sermon here. Not that it isn't important. It is very important. But we're going to have to move down and just, just for sake of time. So drop down with me to verse 32. Peter's been preaching. He cites David. He cites other prophets. And he says, this is what God has been telling us all this time. And he goes, quotes David from Psalm 16. But you get to verse 32, Acts 2 and verse 32. And Jesus, th this Jesus, Peter said, hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, just as Jesus said they would be. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. This is the work of the Holy Spirit that you're seeing. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter is proving to them from the scriptures of the Old Testament, which is all the scriptures they had at that time, proving to them that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior who was promised since the days of Adam and Eve in the garden. And that promise reiterated through this millennia. You crucified him. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're convicted of their sin, understandably so. 
and everything that the people saw and heard was proof of the message that he preached. And the men see it and they're convicted of their sin and they want to know what? How to be forgiven. And what does Peter tell them? Verse 37, I'm sorry, 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent. That's what you need to do. Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. That's what you need to do. Now, does baptism save us? No, and many people use this verse to say that you're saved by baptism. Not what it says. Look at it again. Then Peter said unto them, repent, number one. Repent, and then after you've repented, be baptized, every one of you. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. For. The word for can mean several things in English. It can mean uh, on behalf of, or it can mean because of. And the Greek word translated for here means because of, not on behalf of, or not in order to obtain. I'll give you $5 for that which you have to sell. That's to obtain it. Um, you gave me a wonderful gift. I want to give you my thanks in return. I want to give you my thanks for what you gave me. You're not getting anything but my thanks. It's I'm thanking you because of what you did for me. That's what it means here. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one in the name of Jesus, for because of the remission of sins, not in order to be saved, but because you've been saved, you're going to get baptized, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When? When you are saved, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off and as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So Peter comes to the conclusion of his sermon. Repent, be baptized because you're uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, because your sins have been paid for, you're going to receive the indwelling spirit. And the believer who trusts Christ has the Holy Spirit because of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And Peter preaches to them and says to them, it's time for you to be saved. Now notice the order in verse 41 and we're finished. Then they that gladly received his word. What did they do? They heard the gospel that Jesus preached, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, repentance and faith in him for salvation. They heard that. They gladly received his word. Then they were baptized. Baptism follows salvation. It has from the beginning. It does throughout history. It does today, always will. They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them. Stop right there. There were mockers in the crowd. We know that. We read that. But there were men there who believed. Men who heard the gospel in their own language. Because of the miracle of the giving of the Holy Spirit. And these men believed and were saved. And Peter's telling them, now you need to get baptized. And they did. And the same day were added unto them. Who's them? Those 120 folks who have been praying for 10 days. They were added to them. You know what we call those folks nowadays? The called out company. In Greek, the ecclesia. In Spanish, the iglesia. In English, the church. The same day were added on the church. Who? Those who believed and were baptized. How many were added? About 3,000 souls. Wow. You talk about church growth. They went from a membership of 120 to 3,120 in one day. That's huge. That's huge. Bet you've never seen 3,000 baptized in one day. Well, I didn't see all 3,000 baptized, but I was in a place where they did baptize 3,000 in one day. But it wasn't like this. It wasn't that great outpouring of the Spirit that happened here. This was something they'd been working on for a long time to make it happen. This is a work of God that he had been working on a long time. Those who believed and received were saved. They were baptized. They were added to the church. When? When the day of Pentecost was fully come. 
The Lord came in the form of the third person of the Godhead, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of Christ. The same Holy Spirit came to live in those present that day that believe, and the same Holy Spirit comes to live with and in every believer today. The moment that you believe and call upon the name of the Lord and trust Him to save you, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. You know what we need? We need a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God today. That's what we need. We need the Spirit of truth to come into our hearts and our lives and our minds. We need a genuine spiritual revival. We need to call on the name of the Savior. We need to receive Him and thereby receive the Holy Spirit and we need to give Him control in our lives. That's what we need. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Jesus crucified at Passover in the tomb for unleavened bread resurrected at first fruits 50 days later the promise of the spirit comes folks that's not a coincidence it's not it's what god had been saying was happening and what happens when the spirit comes the great ingathering of the harvest 3000 people are saved on one day exactly the way god pictured it when he gave the law to moses Folks, you can believe. You can believe in God's word. You can believe in a God like that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we do so need exactly what we've read about here. We need you to come in your fullness. We need you to stamp your own image deep on our hearts. We need to be people of prayer we need to be faithful witnesses. We need others to come, to believe, to be baptized, to be added. As we saw you did on the day of Pentecost. Oh, Father, forgive us our sins, we pray. If there's a soul listening today who hasn't already trusted you as Savior, may they open their heart and call on you claiming the promise, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, may they say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you paid for my sins at the cross. And right here, right now, I'm trusting you as my resurrected living Savior to forgive my sins, to save my soul, and to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus.